Kim Shockley, John Bardeen, Walter Brittain. And they were doing the, what if we did these devices and junctioned them like this, wouldn't it be a semiconductor and couldn't it be used for amplification where the transistor was invented? And they, they all got the Nobel Prize for co-inventing the transistor. This is a picture of a transistor. It's a semiconductor device that's used to amplify. You remember that triode tube that I showed you earlier? Pull, that, pull a tube out, stick a transistor in, change your voltages, same principle. Used for amplification. This is a high power transistor, medium power transistor, and then it gets smaller. This is the way transistors are made. An N-type material, P-type material, N-type material. We have two types of transistors, NPN, PNP. And when we look at our drawings of transistors, you notice... This is an NPN transistor. See the arrow? This is a PNP. NPN, negative, positive, negative. PNP, positive, negative, positive. How do I remember that looking on my schematic diagram? That's a not pointing in transistor. This is a pointing in transistor. If you remember that, if it's not pointing in, it's an NPN. If it's pointing in, it's a PNP. Isn't that fascinating? Here is a transistor amplifier. We've got our signal coming in. We've got a bias. The signal is going to the base of the transistor. Current flows up through the emitter, through the collector, through this resistor. DC is decoupled, and the speaker is driven. One battery supplies the whole thing. I want to have to expand on that on the web page because I'm flying through. Here's a common emitter amplifier. We've got an input signal that could be an audio wave that would be coming from a preamplifier. It is dropped across this resistor. This is a variable resistor and it's a volume control. And depending on where this wiper arm is tapping on this resistor, it, the signal level is fed through to this capacitor. If the tap is up here at the top then you're getting all of the signal so it's got a loud volume if you put the tap down here at the bottom or the wiper arm down here at the bottom it's at ground you're going to have no volume at all and so we have a linear uh, volume control that can give us a signal from maximum to minimum depending on where we place this wiper arm on this potentiometer here the capacitor is here to decouple uh, DC but pass AC so we still have our signal here and we're feeding it to the base of this transistor this is an NPN transistor and sometimes we put a little capacitor here on this biasing resistor at the bottom of the emitter to allow the signal to work better and amplify better and so when we apply our signal to the base of this transistor then that will control, and also let's go talk about biasing the base of the transistor. We're going to put a resistor here and connect that to the positive voltage. We're going to put a resistor here and connect that to ground. Now depending on the values of these two resistors here and here, I can make it any voltage at this point from whatever the positive supply voltage is to ground and so I pick the right bias point to allow this transistor to be in the middle of its conduction point and so once it, it's sort of operating but just barely we want to have it where it'll be able to swing both low and high in its current flow from the emitter through the, through the base to the collector depending on the signal so once it's biased where it's turned on then this signal comes in through this capacitor, is fed into the base, and that controls the, the flow of current from ground through here, through there, and back up to the positive supply. That then would amplify this signal a great deal.
and then it feeds through this capacitor and then through to this loudspeaker to make sound in this case. So this is the way the amplifier is working. A little bitty signal at this point is controlling and making a great big signal at this point. I could also put a dropping resistor here to you know, bias my transistor further and allow the signal to be fed to the speaker better. We talked about, one thing I like to think about a transistor is thinking about it as two diodes. Now, the thing about a transistor is you, you know, you can't just stick two diodes together and make a transistor because there's a magic that occurs with the way the dopants are used and the size of the regions to allow the amplification to happen. But when you're testing a transistor, you can think of it as two diodes. Right now, I've got two diodes here and they're connected with a collector and here's a diode, here's a base, and here's a diode, and here's a emitter. And it would match up with this transistor over here. And the neat thing about that is if I want to determine if a transistor is good or not, I can take a standard ohmmeter and I can measure from the base to the collector and from the base to the emitter. And then reverse the bias. You know, if I use a multimeter and um, or a, a battery resistor and LED uh, tester, I can check each pair of leads but from the base of the collector to the base of the emitter. And if I reverse the bias, you should see conduction in one direction, which means it would have a low resistance on the, on the ohmmeter. And then if I reversed it, conduction or the resistance would be high. And so I'd have a high resistant reading on, uh, on the ohmmeter. And so when I see a difference in an ohmic value reading from an ohmmeter between the base and collector, when the polarities are reversed and when I see a difference between of the ohmic value reading between the base and the emitter when the polarities are reversed on a transistor that is an indication that it's a good transistor. If I, I've seen a lot of transistors where I measure and you'll see a good like from the base to the collector and then you measure the other side and it's either dead short or it's wide open with infinite resistance then that's a bad transistor. You know, each junction acts like a diode and you know the way you test the diode is you take a diode and you measure it one direction and it shows a high resistance, you measure it the other direction and it shows a low resistance and it, it, that tells you it's a good diode. If it acts like a total short or a total infinite resistance open, then you know that it's a bad diode. Same thing for a transistor because a transistor can be measured as if it is two diodes. and so. Lots of times when I want to determine if a transistor is good or not, I'll just pull out my ohm meter and I will do, I will check that. Here's another drawing that shows a transistor as uh, the schematic symbol. Here, oh, here's a transistor as a schematic symbol. Here's a transistor as a uh, drawing showing the actual construction of the, the silicon or germanium. And here's the same transistor shown as two diodes. An n-doped semiconductor, now the, the dopant, when you talk about dope regions, an n-doped semiconductor material has a majority of electrons and a minority of holes. Now what's a hole? Okay, now when you talk about a, 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 a atom, okay, now an atom, and, and some atoms have what they call loose electrons, which means in the outer valence shell of the atom, you can lose an electron that goes off into space because it's, it's attracted by a positive uh, electric um, field or something that makes it leave the atom. And so when that has left that atom, that makes a hole. So that makes the atom more positive than it was before. So when I have an excess of electrons in a doped region, that would be considered an n-type doped region. If I have a majority of holes, which means it's more positive, that would be a p-type doped region. So we're actually setting up electrical biases by doping a material. Here's, here's, the, here's where the magic occurs with a transistor.
and um, I'm going to try to make it as simple, simple as possible uh, here, but I want you to pay attention closely because this is, this is where it all comes together if you want to understand how a transistor works, okay? Here we have a transistor, an N-type region, a uh, P-type region, and an N-type region. This is an N-P-N transistor. This is the emitter region, this is the base region, this is the collector region. For a transistor to work, you must have proper bias between the emitter, base, and collector. Okay? Now, we have a battery here called VBE, and VBE stands for the voltage applied between the base and the emitter. And so here's the base, here's the emitter, and this battery is applying a voltage between the base and the emitter. We have a higher, this, the more plates on the battery represents usually a higher voltage. So we have a higher voltage battery here. We're going to call that VCB, which means the battery or the voltage applied between the collector and the base. VCB, voltage collector base. VBE, voltage base emitter. Okay, these two batteries are providing us with the proper bias for this transistor to work. The VBE battery causes the emitter base junction to forward bias. Okay, what does that mean? We have, when we have, when we have no voltage applied to this transistor, we actually have a reverse bias between the PN junctions on both sides of the base because of the dopants. And that makes something called a depletion region, which is an area where nothing's happening, where there's no charge. And the depletion region is sort of the, the, the militarized zone between two areas, if you want to call it that. And that's what basically keeps the transistor from conducting. Now, if I apply a voltage negative to the emitter, positive to the base, what that's going to do is that's going to overcome the inherent bias in the transistor between this junction. Okay? So the VBE voltage causes the emitter base junction to forward bias. Now when a junction is forward bias, that means electrons start to flow. The silicon transistor has to have a 0.7 volt forward bias for conduction. A germanium transistor has to have 0.3 volts for conduction. So we're saying this battery is putting out something higher than 0.7 volts. And so that higher than 0.7 volts between here and here causes conduction, okay? Electron current flows from the emitter to the base, filling the holes in the base, okay? So we forward bias this junction and we're causing the electrons to spill from the emitter into the base. What happens when I start filling a region with electrons? Now this was a positive doped region, but when I go into conduction because I made a positive here from this battery and a negative here from this battery and it started a current flow, I'm actually injecting electrons into the base from the emitter. That has eliminated this depletion region and it's caused us to go into forward bias so we have conduction. So this base is going to start filling up with holes. Electron current flows from the emitter to the base filling holes in the base and creating a negative charge in the base. Now this battery here and this, this region here naturally is still reversed by a reverse bias junction, okay? But because of the different dopants, the size of the regions, and all kinds of magic they do when they build a transistor, filling up the base actually causes the electrons to saturate the base, and they're spilling over, they're like, they're like a pack of uh, wild lemmings running over a cliff falling into the collector. And that's when the magic of, of amplification occurs.
Okay, so electron current flows from the emitter to the base, filling the holes and creating a negative charge on the base. The VCB battery, the battery applying the voltage between the base and the collector, causes a reverse bias on the collector base junction. It makes this go to a higher resistance. However, because of the proportion of the dopants and in the individual regions, in the individual regions, negatively charged, the negatively charged base has a high positive voltage applied to the collector. And a narrow width, okay, let me get this, let me, let me go over this where it's really clear. When these dopants are, are different, okay, when the proportion of dopants in the individual regions and a narrow width of the base region, the base electrons flow into the collector like they're falling down a hill once we start this conduction, okay? And the electrons are pushed through the two depletion regions here and here, and the current in, uh, and the voltage in the transistor would follow the rules of Kirchhoff's and Norton's laws. So, what I'm saying is, when once we start this conduction here, it will actually cause a conduction over here, okay? And the, the size of the voltage here determines the size of the current flow here, from here. And so, what would happen is, a, a, a varying current, a varying voltage on this base would cause a large current flow through the whole transistor, okay? This base acts like a gate or a valve that allows the current to flow, okay? We have the injected electrons that come in the emitter. We have the collected electrons which go to the collector. And these electrons, oh by the way, diffusing electrons are what you create when you create conduction into the base. So the bias on this base junction here, right here, is going to control the amount of electrons flowing through. And this voltage is going to determine the total flow through the whole system. So a little voltage here can cause a large voltage, a large current flow here, creating a large voltage change over here. And so this is basically the way that transistor works. And, and so, you know, if we, if we were to stick two diodes together, it wouldn't work because they, they have fixed depletion, they have fixed depletion regions and fixed uh, dopants, and they're just designed to turn on or turn off. But we have varying levels of dopants between these three regions, so basically, when, the, when we get the, the junction between the emitter and the base forward biased, then it's going to fill up the base and allow conduction even across reverse bias junction into the collector. And that's where that magic starts to occur, where you're going to get amplification in a transistor. And so, yes, it's, it, when it's simple, you think of N, P, N, dopants, but it's also the degree of dopants, the spacing between the base and the emitter, and all of that stuff goes to make a system where a small bias at this point can control a large current flow through here. And whenever this bias changes, there's a proportional change in the current flow and so we have nice, clean current flow change. When, when we take this across a, a dropping resistor over here on this end, we, we drop a voltage across that resistor. Uh, we're going to see a nice, clean voltage change when we have a voltage change on the uh, input to the base, except this voltage change is small and this voltage change is large but the voltage change on this output here is proportional to the voltage change that's applied to the base. Okay, let's go over transistor terms. Now I'm just going to introduce you to these terms and there's some wonderful resources on the internet and at the end of this training I'm going to give you a list of resources I'd like you to, uh, resources I'd like you to look at. But let's just go over the terms to introduce you to them. Alpha, and we're going here sort of alphabetically. Alpha is the emitter to collector current gain in the common base circuit of a transistor. A base is a region that lies between the collector and the emitter of a transistor. A collector is a region through which we have the primary flow of charged carriers.
and that the ones that leave the base. Amidir is the region in which we have the injected charge carriers. And so that takes care of those three. Now let's talk about transistor amplifier configurations in our transistor terms. A common base it's a, is, a, is a transistor amplifier that has the base common to both the input and the output. Normally the emitter is used as the input and the collector is used as the output and the base is common to both sides and you'll see here we have a signal coming in the DC component is is uh, or the AC yeah the DC component is is isolated using this capacitor and so we have a bias here called our voltage emitter right here minus VEE that is then fed through R1 and then that causes a bias here at the emitter of this transistor. The base goes directly to ground. Then we have our voltage here for our collector and that is fed through R2 and then the output signal would be seen here. This is the typical common base configuration. VBB is the base, the base supplied voltage, supply voltage. It's right here. It's fed to the base through this resistor. VCC is the collector supply voltage. Here's the collector. This is the voltage supplied to the collector through that resistor. VEE is the emitter supply voltage. VBE, VBE is the voltage dropped across the base in the emitter. VCB is the collector, CB is the collector to base voltage drop. VCE is the collector to emitter voltage drop. IC is the current flowing through the collector. Here's the collector and we have this current flowing through it. IC is the current flowing through a collector. IE is the current flowing through an emitter. And IB is the current flowing through the base. A common collector is another term we use with transistors. It's also called the emitter follower. It's a transistor circuit configuration in which the collector is the element common to both input and output circuits. This configuration does not produce a phase shift between the input and the output. We have a signal in going to the base. The collector is common to both sides and, and we have our emitter here with a resistor and the output uh, is on the emitter in a common collector circuit. The output signal is on the emitter in a common collector circuit. The most common transistor amplifiers is the common emitter. A circuit configuration, this is a circuit configuration in which the emitter of a transistor is the element common to both the input and output circuits. The common emitter configuration produces a phase shift of 180 degrees between the input to the uh, output, but it, it, it's probably one of the most common amplifying configurations of a transistor. The emitter is going right here to ground. It's common to both the input and the output, and we have a capacitor here, C1, which has the function of decoupling DC, the signal is fed through R, R1, and we would probably see a bias uh, applied to this point to give us a base bias for the transistor to work. And that signal is fed to the base, and that modulates the flow of current up through the emitter and going up here through this resistor to the voltage that supplies the collector, the positive voltage that supplies the collector. And this voltage drop across this resistor, or actually this, the transistor acts as a resistor to this point. This resistor acts as a resistor between the VCC to that point and this whole transistor between ground and this point here. And so it's like two resistors as far as this point's concerned. And as this resistance of this transistor varies, the voltage divide between this resistor and this imaginary resistor produces a voltage at this point. Because the signal going into the base of this transistor is causing this transistor to vary in its resistance, then the voltage drop 
uh, the voltage divided between this resistor and this imaginary resistor is constantly changing depending upon the signal on the base. And so this voltage at, uh, at this point is going up and down, up and down depending on uh, what you want to, um, you know, what, what this transistor is doing. That makes a signal on the output decoupled with the DC decoupled by this capacitor. Notice this, in, the input is swinging positive and then negative, but the output is swinging negative and then positive. This is a 180 degrees phase shift in this amplifier. Here's some more transistor terms. A Darlington transistor is, a, is an amplifier and it's also called a double emitter follower. Two transistors are built into one in a Darlington arrangement so they can operate as if they were a single transistor. A Darlington pair can be produced by using individual transistors or purchased as a single transistor built into one container. And this shows the construction of a Darlington transistor. Cutoff current is uh, the cutoff current is, me is the measured value of DC current when the transistor is reverse biased by a voltage less than the breakdown voltage. So it basically it's where the the transistor is not going to conduct. Okay, continuing on with our terms. Uh, depletion, or let me get this straightened out here for you. Okay, the depletion region is a region in a semiconductor where essentially all free electrons and holes have been swept out by the electrostatic field inherent in the transistor material caused by the interaction of the doped region. The, dope, the dopant causes a basic charge in the structure of the transistor and, and because we have uh, this basic charge is arranged between the two regions, the depletion region is created by these doped regions of an N and P type material. So we have an electrostatic field built into this region and it exists on both sides of a reverse bias semiconductor junction in which free carriers are removed from the vicinity of the junction which means you have no holes that can move or no electrons that can move and so the depletion region basically exists in the transistor when nothing's going on and it's 0.7 volts in a silicon transistor, 0.3 volts in a germanium transistor and so that, that basically is what uh, we have to overcome that bias for a transistor to start to work. An active device is a device that can amplify. Okay, we say it's an active device, it's an amplifier. Now, and then there's another term, major majority and minority car carriers. There are two recognized types of charge carriers in semiconductors. One is electrons, which carry the negative electric charge. In addition, we think of it as convenient to treat the traveling vacancies when the electrons leave an atom and in the valence band of an atom, the hole that was left is a second type of charge carrier. It's a nothing, but it's a positive charge compared to an electron and so it's equal in magnitude and opposite to the charge of an electron, even though it's a hole, it's nothing. But in comparison, we say that when electrons are moving one direction, they create a hole where they left, and that makes a positive charge where they left, and that makes a negative charge where they went to. Uh, BJT stands for a bipolar junction transistor, um, and uh, FET stands for a field effect transistor. And of course the transistor layers are either NPN or PNP as determined by the dopants in the different regions. So a layer is also the different regions of a transistor. <clears throat> now another transistor term which is interesting is saturation, okay? Saturation occurs when a base current and collector current condition re is resulted when you actually put, if it's an NPN transistor like a common emitter amplifier and we put as much positive 
on the base as we can and the transistor cannot conduct anymore. That's called saturation. A base current and collector current condition resulting in a forward biased collector, collector junction. The condition existing in which a transistor cannot increase anymore, cannot produce a higher output. The operating point of a transistor in which uh, a further increase of the base current no longer produces an increase in the collector current or the, um, uh, an increase in the base bias is no, go no longer going to create an increase in total transistor current flow. And also when we think of a transistor as a, a variable resistor, when we have an NPN and we bias the base positive, it takes the total resistance of the transistor down because more current will flow through the transistor so the internal resistance of the transistor is decreased and so when we give it the maximum amount of positive bias on the base the NPN common emitter transistor uh, it's going to conduct to a maximum amount and it's going to the minimum amount of resistance that the transistor is going to have at that point and it cannot conduct anymore and it's saturated and so that's what we talk about in that condition. Storage time is an increase in the time required to turn off a transistor after the device has been driven into saturation. Once it's fully saturated, if you cut it off, it takes a little time for it to cut off. And we have the terms HFB, HFC, and HFE, which is referring to small signals, short circuit forward current transfer ratio. Uh, and this is in a common base, common collector, common emitter. The HFE is the ratio of current through the collector IC to the base, through the base IB, usually at a range of 50 to 100. Okay? Uh, HIB, HIC, and HIE is a small signal short circuit input impedance. Okay? And again, the transistor junctions, we talked about those, emitter, base, and collector. Everyone believes that the transistor was invented at Bell Labs by John Bardeen, Walter Bretain, and William Shockley. However, the first patent for the transistor principle was filed in Canada by physicist Julius Edgar Lilienfeld on October 22, 1925. But Lilienfeld published no research articles about his devices, and his work was largely ignored by the industry. In 1934, German physicist Dr. Oskar Heil patented another field effect transistor. There is no direct evidence that these devices were built. The 1947 inventors of the transistor were John Bardeen, Walter Bretain, and William Shockley. Bardeen, with a Ph.D. in mathematics and physics from Princeton University, was a specialist in the electron conducting properties of semiconductors. Bretain, also a Ph.D., was an expert in the nature of the atomic structure of solids at their surface level and solid state physics. Shockley, a Ph.D., was the director of transistor research for Bell Labs. The Bell Labs patent showed that William Shockley and a co-worker at Bell Labs, Gerald Pearson, had built operational versions from Lilienfeld's patents, yet they never referenced this work in any of their later research papers or historical articles. Hello everybody, this is Alex Voss again from TVE Course, and I'm doing an expanded class here on transistor biasing, load lines, and characteristic curves. We had several parts in our series on transistors, and also, uh, this would also apply the characteristic curve part and load lines to any kind of amplifying device like a tube. And a lot of you have questions about biasing, load lines, characteristic curves, how you create the characteristic curves, how you determine a load line. And so basically a load line is part of a graphical analysis of how an amplifying device functions. It is usually drawn on a graph of current versus voltage and it is for a nonlinear device, and this is called a characteristic curve, and we're going to show you this in an upcoming field. A load line 
is usually a straight line and represents the response of a transistor or a tube. This is a wonderful public domain film made by the U.S. Air Force that does an excellent job of explaining in detail transistor biasing and load lines and characteristic curves. Amplifier of some type will be involved in at least 90% of the equipment that you will work on in electronics. So you see an amplifier is one of the most important circuits in electronics. It's a device whose output is an enlarged reproduction of an input signal. On the guitar, the vibrations of the strings were enlarged by the amplifier. This is a basic amplifier circuit. By applying a small signal at the input here, we get an enlarged signal in the output here. But how does a circuit such as this amplify? And how much amplification can it provide? There are several methods which could be used to answer these questions. However, in this lesson, we'll concentrate on the method which uses this graph, the characteristic curve of a transistor. On this graph, we'll plot a line of voltage-current relationships, which will take into consideration the collector load resistor of the amplifier circuit. This line is known as a load line. You'll find that a load line can be constructed simply by knowing the size of the load resistance the amount of VCC, and Ohm's law. Then, using this circuit, we'll compare the values on the chart to the actual base current, collector current, and collector to emitter voltage of the circuit. Briefly, here are the steps we'll go through to demonstrate how an amplifier works and how much gain it provides. We'll construct a load line, select a point of operation on this load line, apply an input signal, plot current and voltage changes caused by this input signal on the load line, then using the current and voltage changes, we'll compute gain. We'll also change the size of the collector load resistance and see what happens to current and voltage gain. To illustrate a load line, We'll use a simple DC circuit with two resistors. One resistor is variable from zero ohms or short to an open. And the other resistor has a fixed value. The voltmeter measures the voltage across the variable resistor. And the ammeter measures total current in the circuit. As the resistance is varied, we'll put current and voltage on a graph. With the resistor adjusted to zero ohms at position A, the current is maximum and the voltage across the variable resistor is zero. This is one of the limits of the circuit. On the graph, voltage is at zero, current is at maximum. As the resistance is varied to an open at position D, the voltage increases to maximum and the current decreases to zero. This is represented on the graph as point D here. The maximum voltage we can have is the applied voltage. If the arm is moved from position A to position B to position C to position D in steps, a series of points would be generated that would be on a straight line between positions A and B, uh, between positions A and D. Using a simple resistive circuit as an example, we can describe a basic load line. A load line is a line that represents all possible current and voltage values in a circuit. Point D is determined by the applied voltage, and point A is determined by the load resistor. The points in between A and D are controlled by the variable resistor. Since a transistor acts as, like a variable resistor, we can use the idea of a variable resistance to describe the lo basic load line in a transistor circuit. Depending on the amount of base current, a transistor can vary from almost a short to practically an open. With this in mind, let's connect a transistor in series with a resistor known as a collector load resistor, or RL, and a power source 
VCC. First, we need to create the two extremes of transistor operation. To show the circuit conditions, when the transistor is shorted out, let's put a short across the transistor like this. Collector to emitter voltage goes to zero, and collector current rises to 7.5 milliamps. This is the maximum current that will flow in this circuit. On the graph, 7.5 milliamps and zero volts collector to emitter voltage falls right here. This is a point representing one of the limits of the circuit. Now, let's remove the short. And to show the condi circuit conditions when the transistor is not conducting, we'll remove the transistor from the circuit. Now we have an open, and the collector to emitter voltage is 15 volts, while collector current is 0 milliamps. This point of 15 volts collector to emitter voltage and 0 milliamps of collector current is right here on the graph. 15 volts is the maximum voltage in the circuit. By connecting these two points on the graph with a straight line, we have the load line for this transistor amplifier. Having constructed the load line, the next thing we need is that point on the load line that represents the circuit conditions prior to an input signal. This is called an operating point. The transistor's base current is going to determine the operating point. So let's first identify the base current path. Base current has a path from VCC through this variable resistor to a base current meter to a base to emitter resistance of 4K ohm to ground. The base current meter is reading 50 microamps. On this graph, 50 microamps intersects the load line here. This is the operating point for this circuit. With a base current of 50 microamps, the collector to emitter voltmeter reads 9.8 volts, and the collector current meter reads 2.6 milliamps. This is the current and voltage relationship of the transistor at the operating point. The actual circuit agrees with the curve value. With the load line drawn and the operating point determined, we're ready to apply an input. The input adds to and subtracts from the base current. Remember, the operating point is where the selected base current line intersects the load line. The load line is a line drawn between the two operating limits of the circuit. The two limits are when the transistor is shorted out of the circuit and when the transistor is removed or acted as an open. As the input is applied and base current changes, let's observe what happens to collector current and collector to emitter voltage. As base current increases from 50 microamps to 75 microamps, collector to emitter voltage decreases to 7 volts, and collector current increases to 4 milliamps. On the load line, that is right here where the 75 microamp base current line intersects the load line. Then as base current decreases to 25 microamps, collector to emitter voltage increases to 12 volts, and collector current decreases to 1.5 milliamps. Movement is down the load line to here, where the 25 microamp base current line intersects the load line. From the graph, we have indications that a base current change of 50 microamps, peak to peak, causes a collector current change from 1.5 milliamps to 4 milliamps, or a total current change of 2.5 milliamps, peak to peak. Well, with a 50 microamp change in the input and a 2.5 milliamp change in the output, what's the current gain? All we have to do is divide the change in the input current into the change in the output current. 
the current gain is 50. At the same time current change, the graph indicates a collector change, collector voltage change from 7 volts to 12 volts, or a total of 5 volts peak to peak. Okay, we have a 5 volt peak to peak change in the output, but what was the input voltage change? Remember we said earlier, the base to emitter resistance was 4K ohm. Well, with a 4K ohm of resistance and 50 microamps of base current, according to Ohm's law, the input voltage change must be 0.2 volts peak to peak. What's the voltage gain? To find the voltage gain, we divide the output voltage change by the input voltage change. The voltage gain is 25. While watching the current meters, both base and collector, we can observe the current gain. But we cannot readily see the voltage gain. What we can do is apply an AC signal to the circuit and observe both the input and output signals on this oscilloscope. The upper trace is connected to the input and is now reading 0.2 volts peak to peak. The lower trace is connected to the output and is now reading 5 volts peak to peak. So this way we can actually observe a wave shape that represents the amplified voltage. To summarize, we have gain in this amplifier because a small input current change causes a large output change. But to see where this amplification occurred, we need a graph of characteristic curves for the circuit configuration on which to construct a load line. To get a load line, we created the two limits of the transistor operation within a circuit. To do this, we first shorted out the transistor, and then opened the transistor. We plotted the current and voltage points that resulted from the short and open on a characteristic curve chart, and drew a line between these two points. After drawing a line, known as the load line, we found that the operating point was located where the base current line intersected the load line. We observed the changes along the load line that were caused by the very small input signal. To find out how much variation occurred in the output, we went from the lower and upper intersection on the load line across to the current axis. This told us the amount of change in the output. We also traced from these two intersections on the load line down to the voltage axis on the curve. This indicated the amount of voltage change in the output. Comparing the input voltage to the output voltage, we get an indication of the amount of amplification that the circuit is producing. Having constructed and used the load line to discuss how the circuit amplifies, Let's change the size of the collector load resistor and notice what happens to the load line. We will also see what happens to gain while changing the load resistor. Keeping the same VCC and input signal and using the load line we just drew for reference, we will change only the load resistor. If we keep the same applied voltage of 15 volts and increase the load resistor to 4K ohm, the current represented by point A is decreased as shown by the solid line. Comparing the new change in collector voltage to the old change, the swing in collector or output voltage has increased. Making the same comparison with current changes, we see that the new current produced by the new load line has decreased in comparison with the current produced by the load line of the smaller resistor. From this, we can conclude several things. First, that the load line drops with an increase in collector load resistor size. Also, that as the collector load resistor size increases, voltage gain increases and current gain decreases. We begin with a small resistor and increased it. The load line dropped to here. 
we had a decrease in current gain and an increase in voltage gain. If we started here with a large resistor, say 4K ohm, and decreased the resistor to 2K ohm, the opposite would have happened. Current gain would have gone up and voltage gain down. An important conclusion is that a current amplifier would have a relatively small collector load resistor and a voltage amplifier would have a relatively large collector load resistor. Okay, that's what it should do. Will the trainer support this theory? Let's see. Changing the collector load from 2K ohm to 4K ohm should cause the output voltage wave shape here on the lower trace to increase. As the resistor is changed from 2K to 4K, the output does increase. The actual circuit proves the conclusion that we made from the graph. As we increase the collector load resistor, the voltage gain increased. A larger resistor produces a high voltage gain. Likewise, a small collector load resistor produces a high current gain. In conclusion, we can say gain is obtained in an amplifier because a transistor has the ability to convert a small input signal into a large output signal. Amplifiers are so important that they are found in almost all electronic equipment, including televisions, radios, electric guitars, hi-fis, stereos, missiles, radars,